Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I hope I don't scare you off with the title of this slide, but I think you'll find it interesting and that there will be everybody will get something out of this. Today's our, our first chairman's conference where we have our new sub eyes for this year, our fourth year rotating med students. We want to say welcome to everybody. We're happy to have you here. And uh, in honor of your, your first day here, um, I want to talk about the first invasive neurosurgical procedure I ever did. It was on my sub eye here, uh, my first sub eye. Yeah, and that was a shunt tap. I was sent down to the, the emergency department at Old Parkland and asked to see if we could get water out of CSF out of this shunt. And I don't remember what the outcome was, but I remember how I did it. I did it with the patient sitting up. Uh, the best part of the procedure was feeling the needle go into the shunt and, uh, and then figuring out if, if we got water or not. I considered that a success. It ultimately ended up well, um, but I think that as I've seen more patients, I went further through training, we've worked together on service. There's a lot more to it and a lot more you can get out of it. At that time, this was my concept of how to treat hydrocephalus and what, what is hydrocephalus. It can all fit into one slide and it works pretty well. I think that's how I carried out my, my approach to things for a long time. This idea has uh, been around for over 100 years that CSF is made in the ventricles, it circulates around the brain, and then at some point in that pathway, it gets blocked and you build up CSF and develop hydrocephalus. So it's like a plumbing problem. There's an obstruction somewhere. Uh, if you don't treat it in little babies, their heads can get super big. And we treat it with a shunt or an ETV, endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And when the shunt fails, the ventricles get big. When the shunt's working, the ventricles get small. And after surgery, this in particular for little kids, uh, the head circumference normalizes or, or slows down. The purpose of this is eventually to tell you how I do a shunt tap based on everybody that's trained me and, and what I've put together. And I think that with a simple intuitive model like this that, that we all probably still use and, and conceptualize hydrocephalus like this, there's a an assumption there that, that something this simple has a simple treatment. You don't need to take the shunt tap procedure seriously and we'll sort of blow it off. It works well enough that I think we get away with it a lot. I'd like to introduce you to some concepts that I wish I had learned about earlier in my training or paid attention to. Uh, and these just help put into context what you're doing when you're working up a shunt malfunction and what to think about. It's not comprehensive and this is not a talk about shunt valve selection, what's better than another thing, how you put a shunt in, why you do a shunt versus ETV. It's just about giving some, some concepts that are really helpful. First off, um, on this slide, there are four examples of imaging here. Um, three of them are, are abnormal and one of them is normal. And it's, it's sort of obvious, but the thing that's not obvious is what's the intracranial pressure. Those are the intracranial pressures. These are all in children of, of varying ages, but you really can't, can't tell for sure based on a CT scan or MRI what the intracranial pressure is. And that comes back to the, the system. We talk about the Monroe Kelly doctrine and blood, brain, and CSF, but um, the brain has a state to it, a compliance. It can get soft. It can be more firm. That can vary in people as, as you've been over it. Children's have, have seen with um, with our kids that come back with shunt issues. This is a shunt and it's interesting on that last slide, all of those abnormal kids were treated with the same basic shunt, a differential, differential pressure valve. Why does that work? Some of the things in this talk, I don't think are immediately obvious. When you think about them and, and see how we'll go through it, it seems obvious in retrospect, but up front, it's not. The shunt's been around since the 1950s in its modern form, and it really hasn't changed a lot. There are programmable valves now, anti-siphon devices, different, different versions of this, but uh, the basic principle has not changed. One of the things that that's important to think about is, is posture and body position. And humans are productive in the upright body posture. And so we spend a lot of our time upright. When you're in the upright position, the um, siphoning uh, is what dominates the behavior of the shunt and the drainage of CSF. 
it doesn't matter so much that you've got a differential pressure valve with a certain setting as much as siphoning. If we lived our whole life flat, it would be a different story and, and, and the, the valve differential pressure would be a different issue. We live upright. So to get to just understand siphoning, we deal with this every day. When you're flat, that's the picture of the Hoover Dam on the left. You have pressure buildup that lets off water and uh, and that's how, how shunts work when you're flat. When you're upright, the shunt siphons. And so this is with a, with a toilet, there's a siphon mechanism. When you push flush, that's like getting into the upright position. Gravity pulls the, the water through there and not much can stop it. Putting that into people, uh, you've got flat and upright. And the main thing here is that the interventricular pressure in the lower vertical position is dominated by the hydrostatic pressure coming from siphoning the shunt from the column of fluid being pulled down by gravity in the closed system of the head. And so if you're in the vertical position, the column of fluid height, um, the length of the distal shunt will dominate and you get very low, very negative intracranial pressures. This is an old paper um, that was published in the early 90s by doctors Pudens and Foltz, who invented some of the devices we still use today. But what this shows is the difference in intracranial pressure between the supraid and upright positions with, uh, with a normal patient, which is the, the bar on the right side in the upright position. You do drop a little bit uh, because some CSF, they estimate a, a few milliliters moves from the head into the spinal intrathecal space, but in the upright position with the shunt, you become very, very negative intracranially, and that's very non, not normal physiology. Most people that works well, but there are complications from that because it's so non-physiologic. And one of the complications is, is subdural hemorrhage. We see in kids, what we see are kids with craniocerebral disproportion whose brain's volumes are much different from the intracranial volume and yet large subdurals. You see it in adults with the NPH types of patients where that's that's something that, that can be a big problem too. Another issue with outer complication is slit ventricle syndrome. Uh, you can sometimes see craniosynostosis that's caused by this in, ch in children. Another principle that we assume and that this is really pervasive is that ventricles change in size when a shunt malfunctions. And that's often true, but it's not always true. This is an example of a child who was a premature baby with intraventricular hemorrhage. And that was the etiology of the hydrocephalus. That the malfunction, the ventricles blew up. We put a new working shunt in and they got small again. This was a different story. This was a patient with achondroplasia who was a teenager and had had a shunt put in during infancy. And for many years, she lived with that scan on the left with um, asymmetric ventricles, but stable. And then she came in with a shunt malfunction, very high intracranial pressures, very sick, and nothing had changed on the scan. Eventually, going through the process, we figured out, got to change this shunt. After she had a new shunt in a different location, her ventricles equilibrated to, to this different, different picture. But my point here is that Sometimes, depending on the etiology of the hydrocephalus, the, the ventricles don't change much or at all. And so you have to be really careful of that. This is a paper from Children's Hospital in Birmingham, and they looked at a large number of patients who presented with known shunt malfunctions, underwent shunt revision surgery, and all of these surgeries, they confirmed there was a shunt malfunction, that they needed to do the surgery. And they looked at the radiology reports before surgery, and they saw that in 24% of those reports, there was no mention of shunt malfunction or the possibility. In 9%, they called it misleading. The implication was that, that the scam was okay. And so in our practice, when we're talking with, with people in the emergency department or reading reports, when we're reading the ports or looking at, at ventricle sizes, it's easy to assume that, that a no change in ventricle size means everything's okay. And the problem with that is it makes it easy to blow off the situation. And if you have a, a child like with a myelomeningocele, which is a pediatric condition where the ventricles often don't change much or at all when there's a shunt malfunction, but they're the ones that can die with very quickly with a shunt malfunction, it's, it can be dangerous. So just as a, a side note, something that's really interesting is what causes shunt occlusion. Most of the time, 
uh, when you need to do a shunt revision, it's the proximal catheter that's occluded. And in that one slide philosophy of, of shunts, the idea that I, I thought and, and stuck with for a while was its choroid plexus that gets sucked up through the bulk flow into the catheter, and eventually the choroid occludes the, the catheter. This is a, a multi-center study that was published in 2021 where they accumulated quite a few patients and looked at the pathology of the, ventric of the tissue in the ventricular catheters, and they only found that choroid plexus was obstructing in about a quarter of those patients, and that there was vascularized glial tissue in another quarter, and that there was quite a bit of different types of inflammation, microglia, macrophages, foreign body giant cells, and B and T lymphocytes. So that's, that's really interesting that the shunts are inducing inflammatory response. At this point, I hope you see it's it's not as simple as we often think it is. Is there flow through the shunt or not? Will water come out of the shunt or not if you tap it? And it can be really hard to decide whether to go to surgery or not. What does working shunt mean? If you ask the question, is there flow through the shunt? If you could measure flow through the shunt somehow non-invasively, would that, and you knew yes or no, there's flow through the shunt at this moment, would that be enough to tell you if you need to go to surgery or not? And so that's something that, that has been studied. This is a device that's out. It's called shunt check. It's a thermoconvective device, meaning you put a temperature sensor over the shunt where, it's on, where it passes over the clavicle and then put a cold pack behind the ear over the shunt and then sit the patient up and encourage the shunt to flow. And if there's a temperature drop that this measures, then that, that implies there's, there's shunt flow through the shunt. And they can measure a few tenths of a degree of a temperature drop. Here's some, some really interesting papers that have been published using this. 35 pediatric patients who came to their routine outpatient follow-up visits, and at those visits, there was no concern for shunt malfunction. They did this test on them and flow was confirmed in, in only half of them. And there is no correlation between ventricle size and whether flow was measured. And the conclusion was that flow is intermittent. In one patient, they took one person and did 21 measurements over five days. They confirmed flow 44% of the time. And so a lot of the other portion of the time, there's no flow through the shunt. That also supports the idea that flow is intermittent through the shunt. If you think about it, the shunt's a differential pressure system. You're in different body positions, your abdomen, your strain. Who, who knows? There's lots of different conditions that would affect that. But I think just thinking about it up front, when you think of this as a plumbing system that water flows through a pipe, I don't think that's quite as obvious up front. In another paper, there, if they took a subset of 24 patients who had shunt, shunt surgery and measured with this device where there's flow through the shunt before going to surgery. And you can see I circled it. In those who had the surgery, flow is detected in nine and not detected in 15. And, and all of those patients and the way they practice and decided who to take to surgery and revise, this is clearly not a test where it says you need to do surgery or not. And so to put it together, you can have people who need a shunt revision and don't need a shunt revision who have flow at that moment or don't have flow at that moment. I think that that's, that's also something that's not obvious up front, but that's very, very interesting. We do use this device in our practice, and we do find it very useful in certain, certain patients, especially if our suspicion for shunt malfunction is very low. A shunt tap is not exactly this, but the ideas are similar. I'd like to, to take you through a shunt tap and how I do a shunt tap. There are a lot of ways to do this, but this is something... Go for it, Brad. Sorry. So you, uh, your comments on the magnitude of the effect of siphoning are, you know, something I guess I'm kind of aware of, but I wasn't sure, you know, numerically or quantitatively how different it is. Um, do shunts with anti-siphoning devices prevent 10% of siphoning, 30% of siphoning? You know, what, uh, what, you know, do your steps? All shunts are, are differential pressure systems, and so you have to have a pressure gradient to flow through it. The anti-siphon device increases the resistance of the shunt. And so if you take the simplest differential pressure shunt and you put a patient upright, the interventricular pressure will just rapidly drop to that negative value. If you have an anti-siphon device in the system, it slows down 
the rate of that drop. There are some shunts that are flow regulated, like in Orbis Sigma Valve, that try to get just a, a constant rate no matter what position you're in. And those are the closest to physiologic, but still it's, it's just slowing down how fast that drop is. And so the magnitude, uh, the normal interventricular pressure is like, can be five to 10 centimeters of H2O laying, laying down. In the upright position, you can go like that slide I showed, it's minus 20 centimeters. If you're upright without a shunt in your normal physiology, you might drop into single digits negative. And so differential pressure valves, even programmable valves, they range from a few centimeters of water up to somewhere around 20 for the ones that don't have that virtual off. And, and so that range from two to 20 is still dominated by that negative so, siphon effect. So the, uh, the, the, siphon, the anti-siphon device just slows down the, the, how fast the shunt responds to the gradient? but it doesn't actually change what gradient that it's, that it opens at, or that at which it would allow fluid to pass through. So the, um, so the idea is then if you, it slows it enough that once you change your position again, you're kind of, you know, it comes back to normal or something. Um, so it, do you think that any siphon devices are important or not? In our experience, just to, to make it a little simpler, uh, and then to get to your question, we have, people that we do sometimes put in a programmable shunt and sometimes we turn it high and sometimes low. And I've just said that siphoning dominates all that, so it's not important. Most of the time that's true, at least that's what we found. But in general, the way I think it works is that if you have a higher pressure valve over time, you're draining less. So if you if you turn it up, but you're still if you're upright a lot of the time, you can still get into to draining too much CSF. If you put an anti siphon device in, it slows down and smooths out those big swings in in CSF flow and, and pressure changes. There's some really good graphics of that in a, a book called the the Shunt Book, how it slows down the drop in pressure. Hey Brett, not to um, interrupt. interrupt. But the other thing that's the other problem with anti-siphon devices, and people have shown one, it it's dependent on where you actually place it. So it needs to be placed at the zero point. And two, once there is scar tissue surrounding the anti-siphon device, so those that work with delta valves, they actually don't work. So they become non-functional once scar tissue surrounds the anti-siphon device. Thank you. I think that as we get into those questions of how do you make a shunt system that's closer to physiologic and that'll, that'll make your patient feel good more of the time, it gets hard and, and there's a lot of imperfect solutions. When you're working up a shunt malfunction, we started to get into how, how hard it is to figure out how this all works. If we don't take the shunt's tap seriously, if you don't have an idea of what you're thinking about, what you're trying to measure, why you're doing something a certain way, then you can lose a lot of opportunity to get information about this. And in the end, it's there's not a good test that's going to tell you you need to operate or not some of the time, but a good shunt tap is a really good tool. This is a procedure, so plan for it. And the first step is study the x-rays, study the imaging, the shunt series and the CT to figure out exactly what this looks like on the inside and where you're going to tap it, figure out what kind of valve it is and then palpate the shunt before you get everything prepped and figure out where you're going to actually do it. There are a lot of different kinds of shunts out there and some shunts that have come from other, other cities and, and other companies. And there's a really good resource from the International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery that's a guide to shunts. And if you just search for that online, they're the first link. And it has pictures of x-rays, cross-sections of shunts that you can look at to figure out what you're dealing with. We do this a lot in the pediatric population, but put Emla cream on your shunt 15 or 20 minutes and wait. It's prilocaine, lidocaine cream. Just let it soak in. Your patients, it'll it'll be more comfortable. We sort of uh, have mentality to just tough it out if you're an adult, but, but just think about it. Make them more comfortable. Make it smoother and less painful. Do a good prep, big sloppy prep with betadine. Use sterile gloves. 
treat it like a sterile procedure. You don't want to get the shunt infected. And then have your kit all set up in a big sterile field with a butterfly needle, a syringe, a manometer, and enough drapes. And then what I was getting at with that first anecdote for my sub eye is put the patient flat. If you leave them sitting up, it can confuse the picture a lot. You may have a working shunt, but a patient with very low pressure hydrocephalus, like a, a kid with an end stage neoplasm, if they're sitting up and you're not getting fluid out except by aspirating, it's hard to figure out what's going on. You can also encourage if the shunt's working, air to get sucked into the head. Once you're prepped, palpate the shunt again, put your fingers on either side of where you're going to tap it. And it's best to tap the rickum um, proximal to the shunt valve if you've got that option because you can directly measure the intracranial pressure that way. I start off with the syringe on the end of the butterfly needle so you have total control over whether air is getting sucked back or, or water is coming out. And then once you've got your needle in the reservoir, this is the way I do it. And some people don't prefer to do it this way, but but I, I'd use a couple tenths of a cc and just very, very gently pull back on the syringe so I can prime the tubing and I see exactly where the meniscus is in the tubing. And then I know exactly what's going on with the fluid when I take the syringe off. And I think that that volume of fluid you're using to do that is minimally disruptive. Once you take off the syringe, you can watch what happens to the fluid. Will it flow away from the head with spontaneous flow? Will it flow back to the head? It's really good at this stage. Don't just stick the syringe on and, and haul back on the plunger and put a lot of negative pressure on it because some shunts, they've been in the brain a long time. They're flowing fine, but you're not going to get out a large volume by just hauling back on the plunger. You could disrupt things and suck more tissue into them. Before you've lost any fluid, put on a manometer and measure a pressure if you have spontaneous flow. Once you've figured out all that information, when you're looking at that meniscus, see if you can siphon fluid out by lowering the tube and then raise it up and see if the fluid flows back towards the head. But depending on what kind of shunt you're using, uh, one thing that comes up pretty regularly on our service is what do you call that? Is it distal runoff or is it just backflow into the head? So if you've tapped the Pudens reservoir, like that middle picture, the reservoir is distal to the valve. The valve's just right above that inlet. Then if you raise the tubing, it is going to flow distally. That is distal runoff. But if you've tapped this rickum, you don't know, is it going distally or is it going back into the head? So just be very clear about what's happening. And then write a good note so that people can look back and so that five years from now, you can look at what happened, how that shunt worked won't dwell on on the details here, but it, it puts together all the things we talked about. So I think with a good solid shunt tap, you can take that tool and, and apply it to complicated situations. Even when you perfectly execute a shunt tap, sometimes you're still not going to have the answer. And it's going to come down to your philosophy of shunt management and how you see different things. Whether you see it one way and choose to go to surgery, whether you see things another way. Any questions? The uh, anti-siphon issue, I've been underwhelmed with in my hydrocephalus experience. And they, I know theoretically, the gravity is a big driver of that. But is the siphoning really unphysiologic, or is that just the way things work? The venous pressure drops to negative when you stand up if you measure in the superior sagittal sinus. So I'm joking, they said, how many times, and that may be different for you as a pediatric nurse, how many times have you been called to the emergency room because there's some crisis in overdraining or uh, siphoning? Overdraining is more common if you have a valve set too low on it to kind of NPH patient. And then I tried to, I got a bunch of subdurals for a while on my NPH patients, which was probably just bad luck more so than any physiologic effect. But then I started putting in some anti-siphon devices, and those people never achieved the improvement that they had with their lumbar drain trial. Felt it was obstructing enough flow that I ended up taking them out, and that seemed to help. So I've been like, kind of underwhelmed with that. What's your philosophy about sending the fluid for infectious workup or that kind of thing? If I'm not worried about an infection, and I'm just looking at the shunt care strike sticks, I don't send the fluid. Yeah. So I don't think it's it's helpful and it could just confuse the picture if there's a contaminant. Well, that goes more of an expert on this than I am, but I think in medicine, as we take care of people, we 
underappreciate how important the pretest probability of disease is when we order a test. If you don't, if you have a super low chance of infection, and then it comes back infected, it's probably a lab contaminant, which could be as high as 20% of the time. So if the pretest probability is low, I try not to order the test regarding that particular. Yeah, I agree completely. With that yeah. concept, yeah, but it's not going to change your management. Don't get the test. And yeah. if you have no reason to suspect an infection, like you said, that chances are it's going to confuse you more than actually help patient care. Yeah, that's a good point. Tongue in cheekly, I try never to ask a question I don't really want to know the answer to. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned very briefly uh, you're prepping carefully to avoid risk of infection. And that's drilled into our heads all the time, right? If you don't want to risk infection, in your experience and based upon reading, how likely is it that you're going to cause an infection by doing a shunt tab? Extremely unlikely. I think that if you are careful and do this well with this drill technique, super unlikely, like a much less than a percent. But throwing yeah, that out. The real there. risk is, it, is having a contaminated specimen mm -hmm. Or it's not infected, but somehow in the process of handling it all, it ends up coming back positive. In our practice with the premature babies with IVH that get a ventricular reservoir, those babies are getting a it's a shunt tap of this, but of the reservoir every day for sometimes a couple months, and we have several babies on service often. And so putting all those numbers together, the times that we can point to where that causes an infection, it's can't remember one actually. I had a question, Dr. Moore. Um, you mentioned <clears throat> that there's like a difference between the like the Eden's valves where the diaphragm is between you know the area they're tapping and the ventricle versus the one that you showed us. It's so since the that diaphragm is between you and the and the needle when you're tapping a Eden's valve, for example, can you really say much about like the intracranial pressure? Do you think, uh, or does that having that in between you? And, your ability to get accurate ICP. I think it affects it because <clears throat> you're downstream. You can still get an idea of it. If you have a like a distal problem and you are getting flow uh, proximally, your your pudens valve is about a 10 centimeter pressure differential valve. If you have a high pressure, you can still get some sense of that, but it won't be it won't be a perfect measurement like it would be with the Rickham. Hey, Brett. Yeah. It's Bobby. It, it, and this has been a thing for me. Do you need a valve? There's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a couple articles back, like, I don't know, 10, 12 or so that we're talking about. Because when you talk about the prevalence of shunts in the U.S. versus internationally, shunts are, the valves are so expensive, a lot of people don't have access to them. And there's, there's some good looks at just differential tubing sizing um, to actually regulate the flow. In patients, uh, have you have you looked at that or understood that? It just seems it would be so much easier. I've kind of had this in the back of my head. If we had differential tubing sizes, where we could say this is the range based on the tubing size or or, or gauge, uh, and so you know, de you know, opening up a, va a tubing is a hell of a lot easier than replacing a shunt. You could just cut it the clavicle and run a wire through it, right? So I don't know. It's, it's a weird thought, but that's interesting. I think that's a, a good idea. And there's like there's slit valves on distal shunts, um, and those are like a commonly used, really cheap type of shunt. There's different kinds of miter miter valves, which are that idea of the changing the tubing, um, just with the rubber. Uh, it, it may be. I think if you try to run the shunt, um, we we do use a wired technique on some of our abdominal sur. Uh, distal shunt replacements and right. the, further, the further you get from the entry point into the abdomen, the harder it is to to use that Seldinger technique to get it back in. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I wonder if, I, I think one thing, I, I don't know the answer to this, that's probably an important issue is if the, you'd have to have a small enough diameter of the tubing to cause enough of uh, enough resistance and would that include um, more likely than a bigger tube? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, you know, when we used to have those shunt demonstrations where they'd hang all the tubing off, we I mean, we did that like every three years in residency to understand shunt mechanics and things. If 
but I just, I went to that. I went to uh, ask a lot with that years ago. You can imagine how excited they were about, um, you know, not needing a valve. Um, but I don't know. It's just a thought. It's always been kind of rattling around in my brain. It's, it's a huge expense with all the revisions that we do. Yeah, especially if you, if it's people are putting programmable valves in every, every kind of hydrocephalus exactly. patient. Exactly. Right. Good talk. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.